<clears throat> so welcome everybody. It's uh, 2024. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Yeah, <laughs> January the 8th where we are, January the 9th where some of you are. And we're actually in uh, Tucson, Arizona, where we're, um, at least I'll talk about me first. I'm just excited to be here and do, be doing a call at seven o'clock. Uh, but what I'm really excited about is 300 feet away, about 100 yards away from us, uh, is our son and our daughter-in-law. And our daughter-in-law is 37 weeks pregnant and uh, ready to pop any day now. And so we're full, I'm full of anticipation and excitement. So you can probably hear it in yeah. my voice. I'm just jumping up and down. How are you? I am incredibly excited and actually really inspired too, to watch my daughter-in-law as she's getting bigger and bigger. And she just, she just keeps a smile on her face and she keeps doing whatever she needs to do. I don't remember doing that when I was pregnant. I remember sitting down going, oh God, how soon will this happen? But uh, she's, it's a real inspiration to watch her and my son and how they're building their world in preparation to have this baby. And they want us here. How exciting. We're going to be here for probably another month or two after the baby's born by their request. Pretty cool, huh? Very cool. Yeah. So um, today's class is called Transforming uh, Scarcity. And it's inspired by a book that I've been reading called uh, The Scarcity Loop uh, by a man named Michael Easter. And <clears throat> it just really answered a lot of questions for me about uh, what goes on in my own brain and how NBC might really be able to support me in, um, in navigating <clears throat> what he's identified in terms of scarcity. <clears throat> it seems to be very parallel to uh, what uh, what I've learned and uh, experienced in NBC. And so I'm hoping that we will be able to uh, give you some insight into your own, um, own working with scarcity and see what's on the other side of scarcity. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and we will, we will do what we usually do. We'll have a combination of, of self-connection exercises, which we'll start with in just a moment, a chance for you to then get into a small group and talk about what uh, the self-connection exercise was like for you, <clears throat> if you'd like. If you don't want to be in a small group, just put an equal sign in front of your name. And then uh, we'll come back into the large group here again <clears throat> and just hear how people are doing and if there's any requests alive for anybody before we launch into a, a, a relatively brief presentation and uh, go over some, uh, some information about the scarcity loop and then practice. And then after we do some practice, individual like written practice and that sort of thing then we'll go back into small groups and talk about it and by the toward the end of the call we'll get back together in the large group and harvest find out what we can all learn <clears throat> this is relatively new stuff for us to teach <clears throat> at least in the way that we're going to teach it today in fact i've only done it one other time i did it with a group of certification candidates a couple of weeks ago about a month ago actually now <clears throat> They got a lot out of it. I've changed a few things based on what I learned there. And I expect to make new mistakes today. So I'm looking forward to seeing uh, what kind of mistakes that we will make so that we can make the presentation even uh, more effective next time. Does anybody have any questions or anything before we get going with the, the program, so to speak? Okay, then <clears throat> we'll dive in. Um, Oh, is that someone's hand? No, that, oh, no. That, those okay. are chats. Great. <clears throat> okay, so let's do a little self-connection. Self-connection is just utilizing nonviolent communication to work with yourself. <laughs> and so we will focus on, <clears throat> on what's going on for you. You can start with just doing a little orientation. Orientation is uh, the skill of using observation. To just look around in your environment. This is something that we we mammals do naturally, and we usually do it unconsciously. So this is an opportunity to bring some mindfulness to what we naturally do. So you're just looking around the environment, letting your eyes go wherever they wanna go. And the purpose of this is your nervous system is wanting to make sure that you're in a safe place, that there's no predators around. 
if there are, then please leave and go take care of yourself. <laughs> You might just start noticing that as you bring some mindfulness to this observing exercise that your body starts to slow down a little bit. Your breathing might shift. And if you're comfortable, you can close your eyes. <clears throat> and bring that same quality of mindfulness to your body. You might just scan your body on the alert for any sense of tension or constriction. <clears throat> And if you find something, just notice it. You don't have to try to change it. You can notice it and bring a quality of presence and acceptance to whatever sensations you might notice. You might also notice pleasant sensations. Just notice and name and allow. Attend to your emotions as well. Our experience of Sensations and emotions is constantly shifting like a kaleidoscope. So it's a practice of observing presence. You just notice these feelings as they arise and replaced by another feeling that arises. And see if you can link the feelings that you're noticing in your body to your needs. <clears throat> in other words, what's important to you right now? What's motivating you to spend your life energy to be here? I'll make a few guesses based on previous experience. Maybe they land for you, maybe they don't. Maybe you're here for community. Some of us have been meeting together for, gosh, coming up on four years on Zoom. Or maybe you're in search of community. You're wondering if you'll find it here. Maybe you're here because you learn, you might, Learn something here about nonviolent communication. So, learning may be the motivation. Maybe personal growth is important to you. Maybe fun. Maybe something else. <clears throat> Maybe it's not even a word. It's an energy that you just notice in your body that's motivating you to be here now. I'd like you to consider a request, a request that I have of you, which is to think of one thing that you feel grateful for, one gift that you've received recently, 
could be a physical gift, like an object, it could be a kind word or some empathy, it could be a touch, it could be something beautiful that you saw, something that inspired awe or joy. Think of one thing that you're grateful for and just name it for yourself. And then consider why is that important to you? What need is satisfied by receiving that gift? Maybe there's more than one need. And how do you feel right now noticing that you received the gift? And savor that feeling. And then finally, take responsibility for the part that you played in being present to receive the gift. What did you do that helped to make it possible to receive that gift? And how do you feel about that? If your eyes have been closed, you can let them open whenever you're ready. And look around again. Just confirm that you're in a safe place. And we're gonna open up some small groups. To do that in just a second. Let me set this timer here. It's at 60 right now. Mm -hmm. This for about uh, <clears throat> 12 minutes today. And uh, when the time is up, there will be 60 more seconds for you to finish your conversation. And you wanted to move somebody? Someone just arrived. Okay. She's listening. Let's go move her to here. Oops. Okay. Yeah, it's just it's not group. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so we're gonna open the rooms now. If you're not in a room yet, we'll get you there as soon as as soon as we can. We'll see you back here in about 13 minutes. Uh, what, what are you doing in the small group? You're just connecting. You're just, this is a chance for you to, to practice living NBC with each other. So you might have a, just a little brief check-in about how you're feeling in the moment, what you liked or didn't like about the exercise that we just did and so forth. Okay, so ready? We have- uh, These two are gonna stay together. Right, there's one person that may. All right, see you here in 13 minutes. Okay. Zoom. All right. Wow, welcome back. They're still coming. They're still coming. Yeah. J Jim, you look like a doctor. You look like you have a doctor's hey. white coat on and yeah. a, you got a stethoscope, stethoscope around your neck or something. Oh, yeah. Just kind of like that. yeah. It, it's, it's my hoodie, man. It's cold here. Oh, uh, the doctor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
All right. So who would anybody uh, like to share what's going on for you right now here with the large group? Just raise your hand. If you don't know how to raise your hand, then uh, you can see that on the bottom of your screen, you have the latest Zoom software. It'll say raise hand. Otherwise, there's a reaction button down there that you can press and then you can raise your hand there. But love to hear a few voices. That's been a month since I've heard a lot of voices. So <laughs> if you have something you'd like to share about what's alive in you right now, we'd love to hear it. We can't see all the hands actually. Unless you use your electronic hand. Yeah. But there is a whole other page of people. Yeah, we would still see that though. Oh, we would? Okay, yeah. good. Yeah. Anybody want to share anything? Otherwise, we'll start talking. <laughs> if you're waiting. Going to... once, <laughs> going <laughs> twice. If you're waiting to be the last person. <laughs> I'd also be the first person. Go ahead. Go ahead, Sarah Joy. Hi, Jim and Jory. So good to see you. Happy New Year. Thank you. Um, Happy New Year to you, too. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm feeling grateful and excited to be here. I'm interested in the topic of scarcity um, because I'm, I feel like our world needs more harmony and scarcity is something that divides us and yeah. makes people want to hoard or take more space up or, or things up than, and it leaves other people with less. Yeah. Um, I appreciated my group today. Um, and um, one comment that um, one person made was that um, there was some mourning that was happening for them um, in, while you were telling the story. Um, and um, that, but with mourning comes celebration. And they were wondering what the celebration for that mourning would be. So I don't know if they want to unmute and talk about that and, and bring that up, but, but I, I'm curious about that. So Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah Joy. I'm glad to hear your voice. And there was a hand up for someone else, but I couldn't find it again. Do you see it? No. Well, if you want to speak, just speak up. We might not see your hand. Anybody else? Okay, good. Janelle. Ah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Um, I just want to acknowledge, you know, coming into NVC, it, it's a permanent, it's constant practice, um, no matter, I don't know, I guess for me, how many years I've done it. And um, what I loved in our breakout group today was someone said, you know, I'm maybe not so good at, at reflection, but I'm going to give it my best go. And I was so touched with that, um, that you know, and, and would say that that is true for, for all of us all the time. Um, yeah, so just grateful for that honesty and willingness. Ah, thank you. Thank you for Sweet. sharing that. Yeah, it's fun you. to savor that. Certainly my experience, <clears throat> I was talking to a friend uh, uh, recently and uh, <clears throat> we were talking about the challenge of doing NBC in a world where not everybody does NBC, especially when you have this role or title of trainer and I, I was celebrating that ever since Jory and I, be, since before we became trainers, actually within um, a month of meeting Marshall, we started our first practice group. We didn't know anything about NBC, really. We'd been to one workshop with Marshall and, and we were beginners with NBC, but we knew about mediation. So we started a, a mediation practice group. And so now uh, that was in the year 2000. And so now we're in 24. So we have done a weekly practice group <clears throat> on average once a week for 24 years. And that's oh, just, <laughs> just because we need the practice. It really keeps my skills yeah. um, in my forefront as a, as a human being and as a trainer if I do the practice with, with you all. Yeah. So you're all here to help me keep growing. So I really appreciate that. Yeah, ditto. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we have a constant practice group. Right. <laughs> it's called marriage. <laughs> I love it. And there. Sanhu, go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's three years since I came back to this group. I think last week came was 2021 sometime. So really grateful to be here. And the reason I didn't come is maybe because of the timing. And also I was running a practice group uh, for last four years weekly. And I knew nothing about NBC properly when I started, so I can resonate with that. And I used to come to Jim's group, see what Jim and Jory were doing, and I will copy paste the same technique in my group. 
So it was like yeah. blatantly ripping off. Great. Wonderful. And so thanks for that. Yeah, well, thank you for doing that. Thank you for being here. Yeah. And thank you for spreading spreading the learning. Yeah, please, please. We hope everybody will steal everything we do and go forth and share it out in the world. Okay. Hello. Um, I was the, um, <clears throat> the person in the breakout room that Sarah Joy was speaking about. Um, and yeah, I'm feeling nervous. I did, I often feel nervous speaking, but I'm going to do my best. Um, so something that I have noticed is that mourning and celebration are back to back. Like, you know, for example, yeah. Um, uh, the loss of my beloved piano teacher a few years ago. Um, you know, I, I mourned her loss of her presence on this earth. Um, and I celebrated all of the, the gifts that I received from her. Um, and so I was, uh, I noticed mourning for me when I heard you speak of your celebration of your your um, grandchild on the way and, um, you know, knowing that that's not going to be happening for me. And there's a lot of grief. Um, so I'm really trying to find what's the celebration in that. And um, I guess what I've come up with so far is I'm celebrating the desire in me to nurture um, to take care, to nurture, to um, to engage in a meaningful relationship. Um, so that's that's as far as I've gotten. That's, that sounds like a light year. Yeah. <laughs> that's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, as I as I as I thought about, um, I I really wondered whether I'd ever be a grandparent too, <clears throat> and um, it looks like it's going to happen, but you know it hasn't happened yet. But there, what I noticed was as, as grandparenthood was approaching that I was really getting in touch with this idea of being an elder mm -hmm. and that, um, that I can be an elder, like uh, we, we're going to live 2,500 miles away from our grandchild, but that doesn't mean that I can't have that, that grandfatherly energy with mm -hmm. other people. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, there's this uh, young man that comes and does some work on our house. He's only about 21, 22 years old. And I kind of feel like his uncle in a way, mm -hmm. not so much a grandfather, but kind of that, that yeah. uncle, familial, supportive, mentoring kind of energy. Yeah. So I really see that in UK. I see you shine your light with your music. And that's another yeah. gift that uh, just uh, heals and nurtures the planet that you offer us. How do you feel hearing that? Oh, thank you, Jim. I feel really good hearing that. Yeah. <laughs> Sweet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. That seems to clear the board. So maybe we'll we'll start practicing a little bit. The topic again is about uh, transforming uh, scarcity. And so the first question for you is, what does it mean? What? Just take a moment and think about. It. Maybe write yourself a note, uh, a definition for the word scarcity. And once you have a, a um, definition, if you'd like to share it in the chat, that might be supportive for those who haven't yet gotten the definition that works for them. Janet writes, not enough, under-resourced, lacking, depleted energy, the feeling or reality of not having enough. Supply is less than need. 
these readings for several people, not just one person. If you don't see it there. A feeling that there's not enough of something, little or no resources. I like that demand exceeds the supply. And scared. That's the feeling that often goes with scarcity. Scared, yeah. yeah. Insufficiency, impossibility of meeting needs fully. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, this is what not you're writing is not foreign. It's, it's really it's, resonating. It's, for yeah, me. and it's, <clears throat> I think there that is very common, commonly what we feel. So you're not alone in this. And Biao says, uh, part of scarcity is scar, part of the process of healing. Love mm -hmm. that. Attention on what's missing or what could be missing. Yeah. Yeah, so I, th I think we're all kind of on the same wavelength here. So that's what we're going to work on uh, transforming. And so think about your own life and see if you can make some observations about <clears throat> your direct experience of scarcity. And you won't have to share this with anybody. This is just your private kind of uh, musing, your a little journal writing. But write down an observation or two or three of your experience of scarcity. What do you notice in your life? Now, as you, since I asked you to make observations, make sure that you're including things that make, make sense for an observation. What do you see? That's evidence of scarcity for you. What do you hear? What do you smell, taste, or touch? Could be something as simple as I went to the store and um, I went to pull out my wallet and I didn't have enough, I, I, I forgot my credit cards or whatever, and I didn't have enough cash to make the purchase <clears throat> that I wanted to make. So it doesn't have to be a big deal. Okay. 
And then let's make room to explore your thinking about this. Mm -hmm. So now you get to describe what you notice about how you're thinking about this observation about scarcity. What are you telling yourself? <clears throat> so this is the practice of actually becoming aware of the thoughts that you have related to scarcity. <clears throat> so for example, with, with, when I forgot my wallet and so forth, uh, one, of the, one, one thing I noticed about my thinking was I started beating myself up and I went to a really old, old pattern of belief, which is uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not good enough or I'm a dummy and <clears throat> something like that. So that's the kind of, that's what we're looking for is, what are you telling yourself about scarcity? Just to bring some awareness to the quality of your self-talk. So then one last thing to think about is what's the clue? What's, what's an example of a clue from your life of when you experience scarcity? <clears throat> what happens before you have the experience of scarcity? What's a clue? It could be like a behavior, like <clears throat> the one that I'll be using as we go through the demo here is um, a, 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 I know I'm in a, what, what we're gonna nickname the scarcity loop based on the work of Michael Easter is I'm doom scrolling, what they call doom scrolling. I'm looking at Apple News and it never ends. There's no bottom to Apple News and I'm just going reading headlines and I'm thumbing, thumbing, thumbing. So that's a scarcity clue. So see if you can come up with a scarcity clue from your own experience. Jim? Yeah, could, yeah. Could, could you please give another example of, I, I didn't quite get the, that. Yeah. <clears throat> so some kind of a behavior that you notice in yourself that um, that you're doing um, maybe repetitively or unconsciously <clears throat> without uh, a quality of mindfulness. It could be uh, something related to eating, could be something related to information like, like my case, doom scrolling, um, could be having to do with uh, substances alcohol, drugs, these kinds of things. I get that on that. How is that related to scarcity? We're gonna find out. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. There, we're doing these behaviors for a good reason. And we're gonna see if we can find more choice with that, Fausto. I kind of had the same question as Alejandra because I find that when I'm connected to scarcity, I have different behaviors, not necessarily those which are like dissociating. You know, I have a, uh, I become stressed out and I do other things. Yeah. So is that a possibility too? Yes. Yes. Like, um, like what do you notice uh, when you say you get stressed out and do other things? Um, what's an example of another thing that you do might be a clue that you're in a scarcity loop. You're but, asking me? No, not necessarily. Just, uh, just to just to answer yeah. that, just, just to think about that. Yeah. That if you want to answer it, you can, and I can let you know if that's in the direction we're heading here. 
just my my I try to to exert pressure on the other person to do what I would like them to do because I fear that if they don't, I'm gonna lose time and energy and precious life resources. Yeah. Great. That's a great example. So you notice a kind of a pressure building up inside of you. That's that is a, a great clue, is noticing that sense of pressure. Beautiful. Tanya. Um, this thing is kind of bifurcated for me in some way um, in my personal life in terms of, well, I guess it's, I guess it depends on what I think is scarcity of, because when I think of, I think of things like money, mm -hmm. I don't have that experience of scarcity, you know, me so, personally. Right, yeah, but, right. So Not the in thing, that area, but are there some areas like maybe even your mobility or your ability to um, travel? Pretty much. Oh yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah, I got health problems, and I'm terrified about the political landscape. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. that that could be that could be. I think that's a a, a, a common uh, scarcity clue would be worry or anxiety. Notice yeah. and then <clears throat> moving, trying to do something about that worry uh, by covering it up with another behavior, like <clears throat> watching one more YouTube video or whatever. Or, or, and that's where the doom scrolling comes in. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, like like my a couple of years ago, my when the kids were out visiting us, uh, they told me about TikTok, and so I'd heard a little bit about TikTok, and I decided to try it. And TikTok became, um, I really noticed the scarcity loop. Um, and now in retrospect, <clears throat> I, I could really see how TikTok um, really, um, uh, so, so the situation would be, I'd have an extra three minutes be before my next appointment. And I would pull out my phone and I would hit the app for TikTok. So all those are little scarcity clues. There's a feeling of boredom, or I, I wonder, am I missing something cool on TikTok today? So those are those are kind of the scarcity clues. I I deleted TikTok from my phone. I just I could see that it wasn't going to work for me. Yeah, wasn't helpful. <laughs> so just keep that in mind, and 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 now um, I'll just do a little a little sharing about what I've learned from reading this book and thinking about it and some other things that I've been studying lately. So for much of human history, for all of human history, actually, um, noticing these scarcity cues actually was a survival mechanism. We relied on this awareness of scarcity to motivate us. It created craving in us for the next uh, item of food that we would have or uh, protection from predators or uh, to find tribal mates or whatever. <clears throat> and all that was vital for our uh, survival as a species. And so the ones of us who are really good at paying attention to scarcity, we survived long enough to procreate. And we pass along those genes. Turns out <clears throat> there's really good evidence now that these scarcity cues are built into our DNA. And that we, so in a way, it's not our fault that we go down these roads <clears throat> because we have uh, uh, a million year history that paying attention to scarcity cues keeps us alive because we just evolved in harsh environments. Uh, we lived in a world with less. That was just the observation for most of our history. <clears throat> and obeying this evolutionary drive actually makes sense for every single species on the planet except ours. We are the exception <clears throat> at this particular moment in time because this thing happened about 150, 200 years ago called the Industrial Revolution. 
And we transformed our environment of scarcity into an environment of plenty for most of us. <clears throat> so for example, <clears throat> when my um, ancestors came from Europe to the United States, we have some documents that were created by my great great grandfather. And he actually made his kids sign a contract uh, because he was going to be the one financing the trip to the new world. <clears throat> and um, he specified in his contract what he wanted to make sure to, that would meet his needs. So he specified how many pounds of butter that they would provide to him, how many pairs, one pair of boots per year. That's the one that really struck me. One pair of boots per year. Now, this is a time in the before the Industrial Revolution when one of the most valuable commodities on the planet in, in, the, in, the, um, uh, in much of the world was a nail, the nails that we used to put together houses. And <clears throat> there was such scarcity of nails that they actually had crimes where people would go and burn down somebody else's house so they could harvest the nails out of them. And now, of course, we can go to the hardware store and, and buy a million nails. We can buy as many nails as we want. Yeah, and they're not, they're, we're not hoarding nails. Yeah. Most of us aren't hoarding nails yeah. because we just have an abundance of nails. And so uh, the, the, um, one of the things I learned in, in Michael Easter's book was in the 1800s, <clears throat> people in, um, in the United States on average had about 100 to 200 items that they owned. So the average person had 100 to 200 items that include clothing, uh, all the things that we would have. <clears throat> and now if you open up your desk drawer, some random drawer in your house, there's probably a hundred items in one drawer. So we have moved from this scarcity into a, to a, a practical overabundance. So think about some of the things that we have access to that our ancestors didn't, that we still, um, that, are, that we still crave for these genetic reasons. Number one, sugary, fatty food, right? <clears throat> In the old days, 100,000 years ago, when the cherries uh, got ripe, we would gorge on cherries. When the whale became available to harvest, we gorge on fat. And those are the ones of our ancestors that survived, were the ones who were really good at gathering uh, sugar and fat and storing it in our bodies. Well, now all you have to do is go down to the local convenience store <clears throat> in most places in the world, and you can get all the sugar and fat that you could ever desire uh, and, and pack it into your body. And so the, the observation is nowadays, in 2024, more people die from too much food than not enough food because we got really good at, at mass manufacturing fatty, sugary food. And the people who make this ultra processed food actually have figured out how to make it extremely addictive. So they add more salt and more crunch and all of these things that just make us crave it even more, uh, maximizing uh, the addiction. Another one is information. It used to be, um, it took uh, there, all the information in the world up to the year 1500 would fit in one issue of the New York Times. Okay, so every day we're creating millions of pages on the internet. <clears throat> I'm exaggerating a little bit there, but <laughs> we, we live in an age where information is over abundant <clears throat> and the, of course the quality of information varies depending on the source <clears throat> another place we become over abundant is success and i know a lot of people like instagram or facebook and stuff like that and and you measure success by how many likes you get to a post mm -hmm. that you make or a photo that you publish and so people people get this little dopamine hit from the likes and that feels like success. It's just like what our ancestors experienced when they finally caught the fish or they finally found a bush with, with fruit on it or whatever, this rare thing happened. But now it happens 
uh, you know, people are constantly pulling out their phone to check to see whether they got a like for that last post that they made. Well, these are three ways that we might get stuck in a scarcity loop. <clears throat> Almost done with the talking. <laughs> so what's the problem with that? Just think about it for a moment. What, what's the consequence to your life and to the lives of those that you love for this abundance, this overabundance? What are some of the problems that are the result? If you put those answers into the chat, that might be helpful for me to see if I've been clear on what I have been trying to get across here. What's the problem with this? Can you see the question again? Yeah. <clears throat> so the 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 claim I'm making is that we we have moved into overabundance. What's the problem with that? How does this show up as a problem in your life or in the lives of those you love? Global warming, sensory overload, um, the belief that no matter how much I have, it's never enough, a never ending wanting of more, a loss of simplicity, spaciousness and meaning, health issues because of diet, emptiness, dissatisfaction, too many choices. That's one that really lands for me. You know, I go to like order something that I think I need on um, Amazon or whatever. And there's 15 different choices or 50 different choices that leads to confusion. Comparing myself with others who seem to have more deteriorating health. So these are the consequences of, of maintaining the scarcity um, loop inside of ourselves and yet living in a world of overabundance, which is why we need to transition uh, into uh, something else. Yeah. And Fausto? Fausto? Can I check? Can I paraphrase and check if I'm understanding, Jim? Sure. Briefly? So are, are you saying something like we grew accustomed to scarcity, to thinking of scarcity and competing and ad adapting to fight off scarcity, and that is still inside of us. Yeah. And so having an overabundance of food or choices or consumer goods and is kind of like a compensation. We are overcompensating for this scarcity feeling inside, but it's never enough. So even though we have tons of food, we eat it, eat it, eat it, eat it until we are sick and we don't end this scarcity feeling inside and we are suffering the consequences of this overcompensation. Exactly. Not only that, but uh, people um, that are smarter than I am spend their whole lives trying to figure out how to capitalize on this. So, for example, uh, the guy who wrote the book, Michael Easter, he, he is a professor at the University of Nevada at Las Vegas. And you won't be surprised to learn that at the University of Nevada at Las Vegas, they actually have a lab where they study slot machines and other gaming devices. And the purpose is to figure out how to make them more addictive. Yeah, I see the book there, that's cool. Um, and so uh, they it used to be that slot machines were the least profitable part of a casino. And now slot machines are everywhere in Las Vegas. Not only are they in the casinos, but they're in fast food joints. They're in convenience stores, they're in the airport and people will spend hours every day because they're, they're stuck in a scarcity loop. And so what makes a scarcity loop? A scarcity loop has three different components. I'm gonna share my screen so you can see these components and take them in. Fascinating. So this is what they've identified as the components of a scarcity loop. There's opportunity, there's unpredictable rewards, and there's quick repeatability. So thinking about slot machines, you know, if you've got a slot machine in every 7-Eleven, uh, there's uh, obviously immense opportunity 
to keep feeding money into slot machines. The rewards are unpredictable. They're, the, they, they're tweaking, they're constantly tweaking the algorithm to find out what's the least amount they have to pay in order to get the maximum amount in. And right now it's about 50, if I remember correctly, it's about 52%, um, about 48% gets paid out and 52% goes to the to uh, the, the operator of the of the uh, of the slot machine, <clears throat> and so this means that uh, people are are constantly uh, winning. They don't realize they're losing. I, I was I was once with a dear friend, <clears throat> and we were playing. Um, we each decided to spend twenty dollars <clears throat> on. Um, on a game at a casino. I think it was a uh, blackjack. <clears throat> and um, my friend what, doubled his money on the first hand. And I said, great, hey friend, let's go. We, we, we've accomplished our, our mission, you know? <clears throat> but he never heard me. He just kept playing. And pretty soon he was down, not only his, the, the 20 that he won, but 20 more and 20 more. And finally I got his attention and we left because the scarce, it's feeding into the scarcity. So opportunity, unpredictable rewards, quick repeatability. Now think about <clears throat> uh, social media, same thing. Think about YouTube videos, cat videos or whatever, same thing. <clears throat> I know for me, reading Apple News is the thing where I really noticed this coming up. Every once in a while, there's really some really cool article. I'm pretty sure it was Apple News where I learned about scarcity brain. <clears throat> but all these other things are there. I have un unlimited opportunity, quick repeatability, and unpredictable rewards. So here, now let's practice. <clears throat> Pick one scarcity clue that you have identified. Some kind of a behavior that you do that seems to fit the bill for fit, uh, for scarcity clues. My my example is I'm reading the headlines on Apple News. I notice that I'm scrolling without choosing something to read. So write down an observation of something that you do. If you need more time, let me know, or we'll go on to the next step. <clears throat> so now notice your thoughts. What do you notice that you're telling yourself? Or what images are you making in your brain? <clears throat> what I notice is that's really a clear scarcity clue is I tell myself some kind of a coaching thing. I'll just do this for a few more minutes or maybe it's the next article that will be what I'm really looking for. Or I wonder what so-and-so did today. So what thoughts do you notice that are driving your scarcity loop? So while, while you're talking to yourself this way, you're starting to <clears throat> influence the way that your body feels. 
So notice and describe your physical sensations. As you talk, imagine that this is actually happening to you right now. <clears throat> in my case, I notice this kind of antsy, anxious feeling in my body. I, I, I can feel this urge to keep, keep clicking around. If I tune in, I notice I'm not breathing much at all. I'm tight. What do you notice? Just describe sensations. And then check and notice emotions that you're having <clears throat> as you're experiencing this scarcity loop. I notice for me, I'm feeling curious and have some anxiety. If I really slow down, I start to feel embarrassed, especially revealing this to you guys. And I have a sense of guilt I have a, another thought that comes up. I should be do, doing something more productive with my time. And that just leads to this guilty feeling. What are you noticing about your emotions? Now go back to what you're telling yourself. And I'm just gonna be quiet for two minutes and you just write down all the things that are coming up for you about what's motivating you to do this, why you should do it, why you shouldn't do it, why you have to do it, whatever, whatever the jackals are that you're noticing. Just write them out. You won't need to share this with anybody. Just notice what you're telling yourself and write it down. Now a chance to practice some self-empathy. First, as you take, take each sentence that you wrote and notice how it stimulates feelings in you. So when I tell myself there's just one more thing, I, I, I'll just do it one more time. There's actually a feeling of, of desperation. If I, it's kind of a minor desperation, but it's a, it's a little bit of panic. 
I haven't found what I'm looking for yet. I'm, I'm certain there's something there, but I just can't find it. So there's, there's a little bit of panic, some fear. And then link that feeling to a need. So I'm feeling panic because I need clarity. Then my body settles just a little bit. So do that with each of your sentences. Notice the feeling, then link it to a need. Some people like having a needs list to look at. So I'll put one up for you if that's helpful. Another minute or so to do the translation work, translating jackals into feelings and needs. probably into it the next step, which is to move from that needs connected place to requests. The next time you're in a similar situation, what would you prefer to do other than what you're habitually doing? So I noticed that my needs were around self-connection choice, mindfulness, and this desire to have a feeling of satisfaction and empowerment. So I sit with those needs and I just see if a request comes up. So I invite you to do that, just to savor the needs that you identified and just open to the possibility that there might be another choice.
So I'm, I'm predicting that something happened for you as you did this exercise, because you're still here. And so now you might want to talk about it with other friends. What did you learn? Where did you get stuck? Maybe you need a little empathy. Maybe you have some celebrations or some mornings. We're going to go back to small groups and have a chance to just connect. We'll do this for uh, 20 minutes. So it'll be nice and leisurely. Most of the groups have three. So that gives about six minutes for each person or so. So the timer will say 19 minutes, but there'll be one minute at the end. So enjoy this opportunity to now harvest what you've learned about doing your work. And we'll see you back here in 20 minutes. Oh. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Welcome back, everybody. Not that you really went anywhere, just looked that way to us. <laughs> so love to hear some feedback. Uh, what, what are you taking away from your practice? What did you learn about yourself or um, about NBC? So if you'd like to please share, do what Harmony did and raise your hand. And because um, that, that's the easiest way for you to keep track of who wants to share. And so go ahead, Harmony. Let's hear what you have to say. Yeah, this was a really great exercise. Um, and it was very interesting to listen to uh, the group that I had. And what I realized is that not that I, I wasn't sure when we were when you were leading us through the exercise, there was this connotation that I was taking away that to be on social media or to scroll or to be watching our phones or something was like, quote unquote, bad. And I was realizing in the group that like, because of COVID and because of a lot of things, I do spend a lot of time on the internet or checking on things, but that's the way I keep a pulse on my community for socializing. And that, um, I'm glad I made that breakthrough of like feeling guilty or bad surrounding that or taking that on that realizing that that's, um, you know, in balance, uh, maybe I do it potentially too many hours or whatever in a day, but there's still a lot of other things that I do in a day mm -hmm. and that that's a part of the social ability and, connection to others because of this maybe going through COVID or whatever, but um, that it's, it's actually useful yeah. and it's a way that the world is connecting now and not necessarily um, should be judged in any way. Absolutely. So I just I really, wanted to yeah, bring that I, group. I and really enjoy the way you put it because I, I really want people, one of the things, one of the, the takeaways I'm hoping for is that people see that what they do is in the service of a need. And in your case, you're clear on some of the needs that are met by being on social media or whatever. And that that's the most important thing is, is having needs, uh, a connection to needs. And then from that, we get empowered to make the choices that will serve uh, our needs. So thank you for sharing that takeaway. That's exactly one of the things that I was hoping for. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And the, I guess another thing, takeaway for me from, from this uh, study of scarcity is that it's nobody's fault. Nobody's to blame for uh, these things that we're doing. <clears throat> we're not bad for um, seeking, um, seeking, behaviors like uh, going on social media, that it's deep in our genetic makeup that we are, we're actually driven to seek and that we can find healthier and healthier ways um, and maybe more balance uh, as we get more and more connected to needs. That would be my, my hope for myself. Somebody else, please share. Tanya. Um, this was this was actually <clears throat> this was actually a little bit difficult for me mm. to um, to identify the needs and um, 
because well, uh, what I do is I I do Sudoku, and I do that in in a, a kind of a habitual habitual way at the end of the day, and I find that I'm doing that instead of going to bed on time, you know, to get enough rest, and um, so that that's what I had to look at, and. Um, so checking in with what need does that meet and checking in with what I feel while I'm doing that, that was really interesting going there and trying to really, really suss that. Um, but the other thing that I do notice is that a lot of things like social media and those kinds of things that um, I just don't feel that they're they were value added to me, and so I just I just I'm, I just clipped them all. Yeah. Um, because I felt that the manipulation, the increasing manipulation, is. I mean, I'm a techie. I was on Twitter before anybody else, along with all my other you know techie people, and it was a way we had of, of having a a group, and you know in knowing when we were going to meet and and getting together and passing on really cool things and then um and the same thing with facebook that was the way i kept in touch with my friends who wanted to show pictures of their cute little baby and then i started getting all this crap pushed 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 into those feeds that i didn't want to read and and were geared towards riling me up and i said well the heck with you guys and so I have to say I am 100% happier <laughs> having done that. Um, so there are things that I that I do when I recognize when my scarcity cycle is not is not getting me what I want out of life. Yeah, I really I'm really willing to just cut cut the cord and get yes. it out of there. That's the one thing <laughs> to hear that the more connected you are to the needs. Uh, the the more choice you have and that you're you're getting clear what way I'm interpreting what you're saying correct me if I if I'm not quite getting it is that you're really making the distinction between pleasure and happiness and the way that I hold it is pleasure is these these kind of short-term gains that we might get by getting a like on Facebook or seeing something provocative on Facebook or whatever uh, but happiness is something that's much more sustainable like uh, when I when I do behaviors, uh, like you mentioned, going to bed at a certain time or whatever, <clears throat> I notice that I, I'm I'm just generally in a better mood by the whole next day if I'm more regular with my. It doesn't have to be exactly the same time or anything mm -hmm. like that, but this range mm -hmm. of time. And um, so um, I'm really aiming for all of us to aim for enjoying the pleasure when it's there, realizing that it's not going to necessarily make us happy. That there might be consequences to, to to the pleasure like that bowl of ice cream or whatever, but but that my aim is to increase happiness for myself and others. Yeah, and what it includes is self care, right. to be aware of us taking care of ourselves and doing things that really help us to be more connected to ourselves and other people. Yeah, and just you know, really following Marshall's phrase you know what is the best thing i can do for myself in this moment yeah what would make my life most wonderful for me right now absolutely right, right. okay thank you thank you asta yes yeah so this was uh, difficult for me as well and uh, it was also quite timely because i um, have been noticing this pattern of going on a youtube scrolling um for time way more than i would like to be on um i notice that my body becomes frozen in that moment like there is it's a state of stuckness and even when i was reflecting today that's how i felt like it was frozen and there was something in me that said i didn't i don't want to be here and yet i didn't know where else could i be and, and so there was this frozenness and touched into some hopelessness that was also coming up along with it. So I sat with it and I realized there was the scarcity of strategies that I was experiencing. I didn't know what else to do. 
if there is somewhere else to go, where is it that I could? And everything else that was coming to my mind as places I could go to were uh, not where I wanted to as well. Yeah. So um, this was an interesting one for me. And, and as I sat with it, I wondered if, if I could have a list of things, list of places that I could be other than here. Uh, already written in advance so that I don't have to think about it in that moment because in that moment idea. I'm frozen yeah. I don't yeah. have the capacity yeah. so then I made a list of am I needing rest then these are the four places I may want to go to if I'm needing stimulation then I'm, these are the four places if I'm needing connection then these are the four places I could go to is what I've come up with something in me is worried that I've created another list <laughs> And um, possibly a list has only gotten me into a frozen zone. But in this moment, I also don't know how else to um, do this because the option of, okay, maybe just be and take a deep breath is not available somehow each time. Some days maybe, yes, but not, not, not even a breath to just take a deep breath. Even that isn't something that my being is willing or able to do when I feel frozen. So all of that is sitting with me right now. Beautiful, beautiful. I love the idea yeah. of a menu <clears throat> of options. I love mm -hmm. that strategy. <clears throat> it's like a meta strategy, a strategy about strategies. And I also just love the awareness of noticing yeah. that frozen space and honoring it, <clears throat> honoring it and seeing what you can listen to when you listen to that frozen mm -hmm. space. That mm -hmm. seems very, very healthy to me and inspiring for me to hear. Thank you for sharing it. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Biao. Thank you for the for the lesson and the practice. I noticed that um, uh, my ability uh, to counteract uh, this uh, it's a, a function of uh, time and at my energy, and uh, so I just want to make uh, aware that um, we have our individual effort. There's also kind of context that uh, if we, at least uh, my first uh, realization is, is food. If you look at um, organization that associate with food and uh, manufacture, farm, and uh, all the forces are uh, using this uh, scarcity evolutionary power to uh, to uh, want us to uh, overconsume, and uh, that's just one example. And uh, in other areas of consumables, that's also organizational power uh, for their own organizations' kind of growth, uh, survival, um, and uh, so that's. This kind of practice is kind of counter cultural, yeah. uh, counter mainstream. Yes. That uh, personally, uh, if I have the energy and I have my practice, I can resist. But when I'm low in energy, I'm, I'm more susceptible to those yeah. um, uh, uh, superficial comfort and you call pleasure seeking behavior. Yeah. Um, it's it, really, it really resonates for me what you're saying mm -hmm. is like <clears throat> when I do something countercultural, <clears throat> like uh, eat a vegetable that I grew myself from my own garden, I feel like I'm making a protest. I feel like I'm actually doing something that um, that's feeding me and supporting the world and is protesting that I'm not going to eat, at least for this salad, I'm not going to eat something that came in a plastic container that I got at Whole Foods. I'm going to make my own food. And <clears throat> so it kind of feeds this inner rebel in me. Um, <clears throat> and, and that makes me happy. <laughs> yeah, Juan. Thank you, Jean. Um, I like this exercise. There's um, as a two thing I take away is one first is a self acceptance. Um, 
I used to uh, feel like the scarcity is on just my personal um, focus issue. Like if I want to go reply back email, probably I uh, after certain time, one hour, I still going through checking all the emails, not start my my person what I want to do. But then I realized this is a really as a as a society developing all the materials getting more abundant at the same time can bring another side is scarcity. It's like the coin have two sides. There um so much information, the technology, the videos, the message, you know. Uh, through the email, through incident message, just all kinds of uh, ways bring the convenience, but at the same time, this also um, brings the scarcity. Despite realize this kind of a society anxiety um, stuff, not just personal. Um, yeah. yeah. So by knowing that, uh, uh, having this insight, bring me um, more of self-acceptance. Yes, mm. beautiful. Mm. I'm so glad you're highlighting that, <clears throat> that takeaway. <clears throat> that, was, that was actually like one of the things that really helped me with reading this book by Michael Easter called Scarce, Scarcity Brain was, oh, this is so deep in me. No mm. wonder there's such, a, such an energy. Uh, and then when I also hear <clears throat> how... Um, uh, corporate um, the, the corporate world is capitalizing on <clears throat> on this genetic uh, foundation. Then, then somehow I, I'm able to have more peace with my choices and uh, to see that I actually have more choices. So self acceptance has led to self empowerment for me, and I hope that's true for you all as well. Yeah, yeah, that's resonant too. Thank you, Shwen. I have a second second takeaway is a contribute to my kids growing. Because um, uh, I was with my kid in his room. It's his bedtime. I spending time with him, and he was actually um, listen your talk too. And uh, when you talk about the nails, about the food, he said, "Mom, this is so interesting." He's ten years old. And um, that this one I have a record. I want to listen. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah, he's so yeah. He 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 was playing something. I did not know he he was actually really listening. Then I spent longer than 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 I plan to because I think it's good for him. Actually, yeah. he also did he also did act like this. Yeah, and I, I yeah I asked him what is your sin. He said, "Oh, when I start play, uh, watch the." videos you know youtube he looking for some games videos he just keeps scrolling down scrolling down cannot make a decision uh -huh. he said my body just feel like my brain is feel like getting hurt hard to make a decision my eyes getting hurt do not know what to say um my kind of shoulder getting tight <laughs> So I also, he said, I also feel curious, also feel frustrated, wow. also feel feel overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so okay. just by knowing this, I feel happy, Um, you know, at least to bring his some awareness. Absolutely. Um, I don't know if we can do it, but at least he has some awareness, no have those stuff going, going on. Yeah. yeah. So... Yeah. That's a, that's that a, one. yeah, this is huge to know that our next generation too can actually get make this visible in their lives as well. Mm -hmm. So I really mm -hmm. appreciate your mother. Yeah, thank yeah. you, Shwen. And you. Now you took your hand down. Uh, there's time if you would like to share something. Please go ahead. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, no, I was conscious of time. Um, and I was okay, yeah, not to contribute, but I love what you've shared, Joanne. So for me, I think today was really powerful, like it really landed um, and helped me with something I've been struggling with this week. And what I'm taking away is when I'm in that period, so for me it's this overwhelming intensity of feeling and thoughts that is almost unbearable and unable to function Um in a in my daily life 
and I sit in it and I can recognize it, but I can't, it's really hard to shift. And so getting to that, um, I don't even quite know how you got to like that question right up front about the scarcity. And when I really sunk into that and connected it back to something from my childhood, then it popped out that that was actually what's sitting underneath it. So no wonder it's so overwhelming for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so connecting into that gives me that pathway to actually be with it and look at what is it that I really need? Because it's not what's happening in my daily life. It's this, this deeper need. Wow. So thank you for that. You're very welcome. Uh, love from Zhuang, um, watching it in my children, what you've given me is this spark of an idea of how I can have that conversation about their loops are different than mine, but being witness to them and being curious about what's sitting underneath it. So, so thank you for sharing. Yeah, oh, wonderful. great. Thank Beautiful. you. Very inspiring. Yes. I'm glad we did this. We'll do more yeah. next week. Yeah. We'll continue the, this, the, 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 the uh, exploration. <clears throat> There's lots more layers that we can unpeel. And uh, so I look forward to sharing some more with you. If you want to come back, you're more than welcome. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the antidotes uh, for scarcity, of course, is generosity. Um, and so if you feel like contributing uh, to, um, we're still raising money for the recovery efforts in Maui. Uh, in Maui because of the big fire. But if there's, I'm totally happy for you to give to anybody and just, um, you know, if you want to um, send $20 or $2 or $200 to your favorite charity, just as a celebration of your your healing and transformation of scarcity. And then just let us know that you did it. Just yeah. send us an email at radicalcompassion at gmail.com and, and share with us um, <clears throat> what you what you gave. That would be very meaningful for us and yeah. help us to, to savor that with you. Yeah, it gives us a dopamine hit. Yeah, and it, really, we're actually able to get things across and hopefully make a difference yeah. in your life. And gosh, to know, too, that your kids and the family and the people around you. Yeah. So we made it. It's nine o'clock here. And I was really worried that I would be <clears throat> completely falling apart by now. I can feel I'm on the edge of tiredness. I've been on the edge of tiredness the whole time. Thank you for doing so much work. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be back next week uh, unless the baby comes, then something else might happen. But um, we'll, we will, I'll, I'll communicate with you next weekend with an email. And we made small groups of, or big, you know, a chance for you to do an after party if you'd like. So if you want to hang out and talk some more about this with friends, feel free. And uh, we'll see you next week. Aloha, everybody. Yeah. Bye-bye. Oh, did it already. Yeah. Good, good, good. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. See you later. See you next week. Thank you. Hopefully.